I'd like to start off with talking about the situation in Gaza, and then maybe in a few moments, we can move on to Russia. As for Gaza, it seems to me as though this Israeli operation in Rafah has shown the true failures of the Israeli military. They are now having to divert troops back to central and northern Gaza after claiming that they had wiped out the Palestinian resistance in those regions already. What do you make of the state of the Israeli operation in Gaza from a military point of view, rather than just looking at the genocide? Well, the first thing we have to understand is that this is a war that Israel was totally unprepared to fight. Its military isn't designed to operate below ground, and if you're going to fight Hamas in Gaza, you have to go below ground. This is a conventional military in every sense of the word. It's also a military that wasn't prepared to go into Gaza. In the two years leading up to October 7th, the Israeli army carried out massive military exercises together with the United States that were designed to stress test the IDF. The working assumption of the exercise was, what happens if everybody attacks us at once? Can the Israeli Defense Force defend against an attack from everybody? The short answer was no, they can't. But what's interesting is when the Israelis built the scenario, when it came to Gaza, when it came to the Palestinians, the worst they could come up with was a repeat of the Intifada. They never once in a thousand years thought that Hamas would come out of Gaza and attack Israel the way they did on October 7th. Why is this important? Militaries plan for what they believe to be the possible. They use their imagination to say what could be, and that's how you create your force structure. That's how you create your equipment. That's how you train based on what you think the next war is going to look like. Israel never planned for any aspect of this Gaza operation. Their military was not prepared for this whatsoever. And this is the genius of what Hamas did because by attacking Israel on October 7th and luring Israel into Gaza, the Hamas organization made sure that the Israelis were always off balance. Israel didn't have a plan for Gaza, but because of the political pressure put on the Israeli government to respond to October 7th, they went forward precipitously, ill-prepared, with no notion of what they really wanted to do, fighting an above-ground war when their enemy was below ground. Israel has never defeated Hamas. Israel has temporarily occupied territory above ground, but Hamas has always existed below ground and Hamas is killing the Israelis a death by a thousand cuts. Tanks here, tanks there, men here, men there. Israel hasn't won. Israel has withdrawn, claiming victory, only to find that Hamas re-emerges from the anvil that is Gaza. Now they have to send troops back in, but this time the rubble has collapsed into more rubble. It's impossible terrain for the Israelis to operate on above ground. So now Israel is being defeated both above ground and below ground. The Israeli Defense Force cannot prevail in this kind of battle. You can drop as many bombs as you want. You're not going to defeat Hamas. You can send the troops on the ground to try and root them out. You're not going to defeat Hamas. Hamas has planned for this war and prepared for this war, and Israel hasn't. That's the key aspect of this. Hamas is winning this battle in every way, shape, and form. Well, I think it's becoming increasingly clear to U.S. officials that that is the case. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin said as much, maybe about a month and a half ago, and then just this week, we saw the Secretary of State and I believe the Deputy Secretary of State from the U.S. come out and say that Israel cannot achieve total victory inside of Gaza. Now, one idea that the New York Times and many in the mainstream media seem to be running with, now recognizing that Israel frankly cannot win and achieve their goals, is that if simply Israel finds and takes out Sinwar, that will be a victory for Israel. Do you think that there are any possibilities that Israel can locate and take out Mr. Sinwar? Sure, I mean, he's a target, and if you put enough resources on a given target, 
there's a chance that you're going to locate that target. And then once Israel locates the target, Israel should have the capacity to eliminate the target. The fact that Sinwar has survived this long, though, shows that Hamas understands the importance of keeping this man alive. Israel has no clue where this man is. That doesn't mean that tomorrow they couldn't get lucky. That doesn't mean that in a week they couldn't get lucky. But here's the problem. If you're focused on Sinwar, you're focused on the wrong thing. Hamas is an organization. It goes beyond one person. Israel didn't say, I mean, that's like the United States saying, if we kill Bin Laden, we've defeated Al-Qaeda. No, not at all. We killed a 57-year-old diabetic in a building in Abedabad, Pakistan. Al-Qaeda is a global phenomenon now. It's larger than one individual. Hamas is so much more than one man. I mean, I'm not trying to denigrate Mr. Seinwer. Obviously, he's a leader of great capacity, but an organization like Hamas isn't based on a cult of personality. It's based upon core beliefs that are built around the idea of resisting Israel. The Hamas fighters today fight not because of Sinwar. They fight because they believe in their cause. And if Sinwar is killed, Hamas will exist. Hamas will continue both militarily and politically. Remember, Israel has defined victory in this conflict as the military destruction of Hamas. They're not even close to achieving that and the political dismemberment of Hamas. Hamas is stronger today, politically, than they have ever been. Israel is losing across the board. They've lost politically. They've lost militarily. They're losing economically. Getting rid of Sinwar doesn't accomplish anything. In fact, it shows how impotent Israel truly is. You know, you were the first person I brought on my program when this all began, not too long after the invasion of Gaza, and everything you're saying now you predicted back then. And just like you predicted everything would fall in the way it has with the special military operation in Ukraine. And it's so crazy. The mainstream media continues to call us conspiracy theorists and cranks. But it seems as though you've gotten just about everything correct. Moving now to the special military operation in Ukraine. We've seen Russia launch what looks like a bit of a minor offensive in the Kharkov region. Could you provide us with some updates about what this is and whether the goals are to permanently liberate Kharkov or is this simply just a measure to try and distract and weaken troops and pull them from fighting in the Donetsk against Russian forces? Look, Russia has been engaged in a war of attrition against Ukraine ever since the initial gambit failed. The initial gambit of this conflict was to come in boldly, come in fast, and to compel Ukraine to get to the negotiating table. Militarily, they accomplished what they needed to accomplish. Within a week, Ukraine was at the negotiating table, and in less than a month, or a little more than a month, Ukraine was signing a peace deal. From a military standpoint, the Russian operation was brilliant because it compelled Ukraine to go to the negotiating table. Unfortunately for Ukraine, Russia, and the world, the Ukrainians walked away from that peace agreement. Since that time, Russia has been engaged in a war of attrition against the Ukrainians that is designed to achieve two primary goals. One is demilitarization. This is important. People need to understand this. Stop looking at a map and saying, Aha, the Russians haven't moved very much. The map hasn't changed. Ukraine is winning. That's not what it's about, ladies and gentlemen. At least that's not what it's been about for the last nearly year and a half. It's about killing Ukrainians. It's about destroying Ukrainian equipment. On this, Russia has been tremendously successful. This war of attrition has been designed to grind not just Ukraine down, but NATO down, the collective West, which has poured hundreds of billions of dollars of military assistance into this conflict. On this front, 
Russia has achieved its objective. They have worn the Ukrainians down to where they have no more manpower reserves. Ukraine right now is talking about an emergency mobilization of personnel. Anybody who's been involved in military recruiting knows this. You have to keep recruiting. You have to keep training no matter what. Because as troops rotate out, as people retire, as people say, Hi, done my three years. I've done my five years. I buy ID, you hang. You have to have people behind. Them in a pipeline who are already fully trained to plug in to maintain combat effectiveness. What happened with Ukraine is first of all, their army has been destroyed at least three times and rebuilt three times. Each time you rebuild that army, you lose the experience. The first army that fought against the Russians in 2022 had seven years of experience at the hands of NATO training. NATO trainers were training them in Western Ukraine. This army was expanding and it was a very well-equipped, well-led, experienced army. That army was destroyed. NATO rebuilt it. The troops that came in to replace weren't as effective as the original troops because instead of seven years experience, they had a few months of experience. They were killed. They were destroyed. The next army that was built to replace them had even less experience, less equipment. Now we're dealing with an army that is literally incapable of standing toe to toe against the Russians. The Ukrainian army today, in comparison to the army that existed when this conflict began, is a shadow of its former self.